Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering at the University of Calgary. And this is module 15 in my computer networks lecture series, where I talk a little bit about the ethernet standard. And we're coming to the end of our discussion of the data link layer, layer two. And of course, ethernet is one of the, if you like, rock stars of layer two. It is a standard that is a networking standard that is used all across the globe and from everywhere from our our households to large you know to network large campuses and enterprise um, facilities i'm going to talk just a little bit about ethernet at a relatively high layer in this lecture series it is never my purpose to dive down into the details of a standard and i do that for a couple of reasons one is there are a lot of details in a standard and it takes a long time. Also, it tends to, um, sometimes we, we sort of lose sight of the forest because we're looking down at the details, we're looking at the trees. And also um, very quickly, the, these discussions would become dated. So standards are constantly evolving and um, changing. So what is current, today in five years from now will already be out of date, perhaps even sometimes quicker than that. Again, the purpose of this lecture series is not so much to make you an expert in ethernet or an expert in Wi-Fi, but to just talk about the fundamental concepts, the, the big problems that we're trying to solve in network design that are sort of present in every single protocol and talk a little bit about how different protocols solve these problems. But if you have a good understanding of what the issues are and kind of the solution space, then you know if you do find yourself working in the communication networks field, very quickly you'll dive into whatever particular standard is relevant for your job and you'll be able to understand not only why the standard is designed the way that it is, but hopefully how it could be improved if you're working in network development. So with that, I'm just going to talk about a, a few big concepts related to engineering. Uh, the first one is the notion of a MAC address. And for anybody who has done any sort of home IT work, if you've set up a, a network at home or maybe you've, you've set up a network at your job. I know I've been setting up home Ethernet networks for a long time for myself and I'm the IT support person for all of my family. So I, I work with um, MAC addresses a lot. And an Ethernet device is identified by its MAC address. And of course, MAC stands for uh, Medium Access Control Protocol. And it is basically how packets are sent by the layer two algorithm built into the ethernet standard. And ethernet device addresses, MAC addresses consist of six bytes and that we typically write out in hex notation. And you can often find these MAC addresses written sometimes physically on your network device if you're installing a, a network card or a network transceiver or you can find it in the software settings configurations of your of your operating system the first three bytes are the organ organizationally unique identifier or oui that indicates the manufacturer um, so for example cisco has 000c as one of its um, ouis and the interesting thing about MAC addresses is that manufacturers try to give every single network device a unique, um, a unique MAC address. You know, and it, it is possible because sometimes you can rewrite or reprogram your, your MAC address for there to potentially be the possibility for two devices on the same Ethernet network to share the same MAC address, but the probability is very, very, very low. So for all intents and purposes, you can assume that these MAC addresses are unique. There is one MAC address that is reserved, and that's the address that consists of all ones, and that's used to send what's known as a broadcast packet on an Ethernet network that will be received 
and processed by all devices on that network. Oh, something else I should mention as well is, of course, Wi-Fi um, devices also basically use MAC addresses that follow this, this same format. So if you're, if you're working setting up a, a Wi-Fi system, you'll be working with MAC addresses as well. So starting out with a little bit of a walk down memory lane, at least for me, uh, Ethernet was originally a networking system that was designed to, designed to run over coaxial cable. And so the very first Ethernet cards that I ever remember working with had already, were, were already transitioning away from this technology, but I, I do remember owning a few that still connected to coaxial cable. And literally, each of the network cards would connect with one of those T-type um, coaxial cable connectors. And this was truly a shared physical channel. So if one node transmitted on the shared wire, all nodes on that wire would receive that transmission. So it was very similar to the shared wireless channel that we, we deal with today in Wi-Fi. There were a couple variants. There was 10 base 5, which was able to transmit 500 meters, and 10 base 2 that was able to transmit 200 meters. I only ever remember working with 10 base 2. 10 base 5, I believe, needed a, a thicker, higher quality coaxial cable. 10 base 2 was just sort of the El Cheapo um, coax cable that you sometimes use in your undergraduate labs to connect to oscilloscopes. We use, they had the BNC style coaxial cable connectors. So it was really oscilloscope type cable that um, was used on 10 base 2. However, very quickly, Ethernet transitioned to twisted pair copper wire. And that's where we got the 10 base T version of Ethernet. Oh, sorry, the, the 10, by the way, refers to 10 megabits per second. So 10 megabits per second was the original raw sort of um, physical layer throughput of Ethernet. So 10 base T referred to twisted pair, and this eventually evolved into 100 base T, and of course now we have gigabit Ethernet that works over um, a twisted pair as well. And an Ethernet connector has eight pins to accommodate four pairs uh, for a while, and, and, the, and the use of these pairs has kind of evolved as the Ethernet standard has evolved. For a while, it was used to sort of as a, a way to detect collisions. So collision detection um, occurred by transmitting over one twisted pair and listening to see if somebody else was transmitting over another twisted pair. Things have now evolved where more and more pairs are just used for parallel um, channels of transmission to improve our throughput. And standard cabling was category five or category five E. Now we've got cat six cable and, and better. And better cable basically refers to more twists in the wire and sometimes better shielding um, within the wire to prevent um, crosstalk between cables. The reason why more twists improves our throughput is because differential signaling is used on these twisted pairs. So a positive voltage is sent on one wire and a, a mirrored negative voltage is sent on the other. And so when an interfering signal um, is uh, sort of couples into that, that cable, adding the, um, the interfering signal is additive on both of, the, both of the cables. And so when you do the differential receiving, that interference is basically canceled out. And the more twists you have in your, your copper wire, the better the, um, the better that interference canceling is. However, of course, the more expensive the cable is because if you twist it more, you, you use more copper, basically. Now we've got, um, of course, gigabit ethernet. This is the standard currently um, as, we, as we speak. So, I mean, I've got gigabit ethernet everywhere in my house and I, I'm sure those of you um, who have networks at home do as well. And gigabit ethernet, sometimes re referred to as thousand base X, but that's not as common a name, uh, can run over twisted pair 
cabling or fiber now. And um, the fiber, of course, allows greater transmission distance, but not necessarily more throughput. And we, um, when using twisted pair, it is known as a thousand base T and all four pairs are used, as I was saying, as, as parallel channels. Uh, we use cat six or cat seven cable. And as I said, these cables are just have more twists and are, are better shielded. And what's going beyond? Well, you know, at the time of recording, um, while not in typical household use, there are 10 gigabit, 40 gigabit, 100 gigabit ethernet variations of ethernet. These are tend, these tend to be used for high throughput kind of backhaul links. Like for example, connecting to large buildings on campus, you know, sort of with all of that, the traffic that needs to go through those buildings, um, connecting large sort of company networks to the broader internet of, um, you know, a service provider. And they run also on copper and fiber. And it's interesting, ethernet standards are also sort of moving beyond um, the sort of traditional computer network application, at least in the research space, where variations of the standards are being explored for on-chip communication and chip-to-chip -chip communication. And we'll see where, where, go, where, where things go from here. So back when Ethernet was implemented over a coaxial cable, you would have several nodes kind of hanging off this sort of shared wire. But even back in the original 10 base T standard, as soon as we moved to twisted pair, we moved away from this sort of linear network topology to a star topology. So for example, if we had, you know, three personal computers or nodes that we wanted to network together, we would connect them all to a central device or box and the twisted pair um, ethernet cable that we're all familiar with would connect from the network card in A to a port in the central box, B would connect into a different port, C would connect into a different port. And this central box is known as either a hub or a switch. Hubs are old fashioned now. Um, basically everything that you buy is a switch, but it's still worthwhile talking about the difference between the two because it gives you an appreciation of how the need for a Mac protocol has kind of evolved as the ethernet standard has evolved. And so first of all, a hub effectively connects all the wires leading the nodes together and all nodes, all users share a common collision domain. What we mean by that is every node hears the transmission from every other node. So even though these nodes no longer share a common physical wire, like they did in the coaxial cable situation, when node A transmits, node B and C can hear that transmission, as well as any other device that happens to be connected to the hub. Switches, however, are a little bit smarter. Switches learn the MAC addresses of all the devices connected to it and will only send packets to the node with the address in the packet. And just to clarify this, um, this is an example of a hub. So let's say node A wants to send a packet to node C. So this packet is from node A and it's addressed to node C. And when it's received by the hub, it will indeed get forwarded to node C. However, the hub is gonna also send the packet to node D and is also gonna send the packet to node B. And so it's, there's very little intelligence in a hub. Um, it just basically any packet it receives, it sends to all the other ones. And it, this is exactly like having a shared wire or a shared wireless channel. And in this case, you need a Mac algorithm to listen to the channel, wait till it's free, and then um, transmit uh, when, when, when the shared channel is idle. 
However, switches are a little bit different. Switches will, as I mentioned in the previous slide, learn the MAC addresses of all the devices connected to it and will only send the packet to the, um, the destination device being addressed. And so from node A to node C, when node A wants to send a, send a packet to node C, it will only send that packet to node C and won't send it to anybody else. And this actually allows for simultaneous transmission between nodes. So if node B wanted to send an address to node D, it could do this at the same time that node A is transmitting, the switch would just receive it and send it on to node D. And so you can have simultaneous transmission that no longer interferes with each other. And in fact, if a switch is doing its job properly, you'll never ever have one node interrupting another node. You could have a situation where, for example, if node A was sending a, a packet to node C and node B also wanted to send to node C, what would happen is it would transmit and the switch would then just tempor temporarily halt that transmission. And instead of passing it directly onto node C, it would instead buffer that packet, wait till node A was finished transmitting and send the packet along to node C after node A was finished. And in that way, it basically eliminates um, collisions. And so there's not really a need for a MAC address in a switch connected ethernet network anymore because the switch will basically sort of um, detect potential collisions and use buffering to uh, prevent those packets from colliding and we'll just send them sort of in sequential order rather than having them overlap in time. Now, does this mean we no longer have packets lost on the internet? Of course not. And, but it does mean that the mechanism for packet loss is different. Rather than having two packets sort of electrically overlap with each other in some sort of shared channel, like it would if we had a shared wire, packets are instead lost by overwhelming the buffers in the switches. So if we have, you know, in this, whoops. In this example, if we have node A trying to send to node C, node D trying to send to node C, node B trying to send to node C, um, the switch will buffer all the packets destined for node C and will try to send them in the, in the proper order. But if the incoming traffic is too heavy, eventually the buffer will be, over, will be filled up on the switch and packets will be dropped just because there's nowhere to put them. And so rather than having electrical interference, um, collisions, true you know, overlapping collisions, if you like, packets are just dropped if there's nowhere for the, the switch to put them. And finally, just a notion of um, you know, how ethernet networks are connected together. Ethernet networks, multiple ethernet networks can be connected together using something called bridges. And bridges, basically, as the name suggests, will connect several Ethernet LANs together. So each of these Ethernet LANs that I'm circling here would actually consist of many computers all connected in a star configuration to some sort of large central industrial switch so that you might find on a campus or in a large office building. And then the bridges just connect those large switches together so ethernet traffic can flow across lands. The thing about bridges is that bridges need to learn the MAC addresses of all other devices connected across this entire network. So once a bridge is connected, then it needs to learn and know the address of all the devices. So if a device on LAN 1 
is trying to send to another device on LAN 3, this bridge needs to know all the addresses of the devices over here on LAN 3 so it can appro appropriately route the packet to through LAN 2 all the way up to LAN 3. And so bridges have a global, they have global address knowledge. Now this is kind of an interesting segue into the next part of our discussion, which will be layer three or the routing layer, where we talk about how packets are routed across the internet. Because the routers that work on the internet do not have global address space knowledge. They do not know where every possible other node is located on the internet. Um, this occurs in ethernet networks, but not in IP networks. And we'll talk about how, what sort of tricks and techniques layer three uses to get around this, this problem of, of needing global address knowledge.